All right, my friends, welcome once again to the next episode of the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel. I'm Matt Schifferly, as always, helping you to simplify fitness to help you break free of the diet and exercise rat race via a fundamental approach to diet and exercise. Today's sponsor is by a new webinar workshop that I am proud to be part of, the Breaking Through with Weight Loss webinar series. It's a completely free event. Links down below in the description to check out more. It's uh, basically a fun little thing that got uh, reached out to me. Christina is uh, bringing a bunch of speakers together myself because at the end of the day, I'm one of these folks who believes that just simply losing the weight or sticking to a good diet is not nearly enough to truly live your best life. When it comes to true health and well-being and quality of life, the best thing you can do is to get the whole weight management and food thing just done, taken care of, out of the way so you never have to think or worry about it ever again. And that's what this seminar series is all about, and especially what I address in my little module that I talked about for about an hour or so. So if you have any sort of qualms with weight issues, body image, uh, struggling with food, that sort of thing, sign up for the free event down below. It runs, I believe it starts on February 5th, and uh, it could be well worth your while because ultimately, the battle against the body should not be something that we're proud to wage against. It should be something that we make peace with. So again, the link is down below in the description. Okay, now what we are talking about today is a very important topic, which I started to touch on last week, a new experiment that I started, and a lot of you were somewhat interested in it, so kind of touched a bit of a nerve. So I figure I would make it more about this week's topic, which is what would happen if you did one set per day of, well, just any exercise or the regular exercise. Like, what if you did one set of pull-ups a day? What if you did one set of handstand push-ups a day? Instead of having a workout that you did two, three times a week where you're putting in a lot of work and a lot of energy and a lot of effort, what if you had like micro workouts every single day? And that's exactly what I've been doing because the point of my experiment is to break through a little bit more of the inertia and the friction that I've been having with some of the exercises that I've just long struggled with. I've long struggled with bridging and I've long struggled with handstand work in general, especially handstand push-ups. And it's not surprising why, because the two are actually fundamentally very similar to each other. And uh, the biggest reason for me has been that my back activation, my scapular stability and control has for the majority of my life been absolutely atrociously bad. And I've gone through a lot of extensive therapy and uh, uh, chiropractic uh, work and stuff a couple of years ago to just even start to improve it a little bit. Back activation, getting my right lat on, my lower left trap, uh, my, or my lower right trap rather, scapular stability, a whole host of issues that I'm still working with a little bit. But now that it's getting a lot better and a lot more improved, I started to think, okay, I really got to move the needle on these exercises because they're something that I've always been woefully inefficient at and ineffective at. Proof positive that you can certainly practice something for years on end and never really get all that good at it. There's this myth in our fitness culture and life in general that if you just keep showing up and you put in the effort and you just keep working at it, then things are eventually going to win out. And that is a complete myth. It is entirely possible in fact, highly probable in my experience that you can work extremely hard at something and never really succeed at it. it happens all the time. So I'm always looking for little ways to kind of maybe hack my way into like, how do I get the needle moving, not just at all, but even faster. And so one of the ways that we can do this is to increase the frequency that we're practicing something. But of course, we also have the catch 22 of, yeah, but if you're doing something a lot more, you're also imparting more stress on the body. So the reason why this can potentially work is because there's kind of a, a momentum that can build in both positive and negative directions. We all kind of are familiar with the idea that if we are familiar and comfortable and feel proficient with an activity, then we feel like we want to do it more. And because we want to do it more, we get more comfortable and more proficient with it, which leads to wanting to do it more and we get more comfortable and proficient at it. And it's an upward spiral. But the opposite can also happen where we'll have an activity or an exercise that we don't feel comfortable with, that we don't feel very proficient. It feels kind of wonky and oh, I'm not so good at this. And as a result, we don't practice it very much. 
And as a result, we get less comfortable with it and we don't practice it as much. And it's a downward spiral. So the whole point is I'm trying to bring this from kind of a neutral plateau or even slightly downward spiral to more of an upward spiral. Because I've seen this happen many times with people where they're like, oh, I hate this exercise. I hate doing legs. I hate doing pull-ups or whatever. And I said, okay, from now until the end of the month, the only exercise you're allowed to do for your pull chain is pull-ups. What? I don't want to do that. I said, I know. Give it one month. If at the end of the month, you still don't like pull-ups, never do them ever again. Do something else. Rows, bend over rows, pull downs, whatever. But give this a real serious shot. And inevitably, they're always coming back at the end of the month. Like, dude, now all I want to do are pull-ups. I'm amazing at them. I got fuck. So it's breaking an inertia, a momentum, if you will. And that's what I'm trying to do with this experiment. And a lot of you were chiming in on how you thought it would go. Oh, this would be a great idea. Or no, this is a bad idea and stuff like that. So let's start to compare notes. Let's keep the discussion rolling forward. Is this going to be a good thing? Is it going to be a bad thing? Or in many ways, it very well may not be anything at all. It may not do anything whatsoever and just be kind of a different way to make applesauce. And I'll be answering your questions as always. Let's get to a couple here. Master Dave is coming on saying, hello, Matt. Is one exercise per chain enough to build muscle, let's say, on a PPS style workout? The answer to that is, of course. In fact, in my experience, the majority of people who build an impressive physique or an impressive level of performance tend to have a much more pared down, simplified program than you might otherwise think. You could almost use it as a little bit of a litmus test to see how much of an amateur somebody is by looking at their program. Like how much of an expert are you? Because you could look and be like, oh dude, you've got five different pull chain exercises here. Beginner, huh? (laughs) Versus someone who's like, oh yeah, I'm time for my workout. Well, what are you doing in your workout today? Dips and pull-ups. Well, what else? That's it. That's all I'm doing. Dips and pull-ups and stuff. And it's not so much how much you do. It's the level of proficiency you bring to the exercise. Or as they often say, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Give me someone who is really good at five exercises for the entire body, and you're probably going to have vastly superior results to someone who's mediocre at best at 20 exercises. And that's not to say you should do five exercises. That's not to say you should only do a little, a few exercises and stuff, because you have to match it with proficiency. There's nothing wrong with having five different push chain exercises in a workout, And in some disciplines, it may be more beneficial, like with competitive bodybuilding. But in most cases, I would say not only is it possible, I would say it's even better for most people eventually to reach to that point of you have one or two basic fundamental exercises per tension chain. Cristobal is saying, hey, Matt, good to see you as to you, my friend. Uh, What is your opinion, the best strength training modality to get as strong as possible. And why? Well, just anything where you can put a lot of resistance through your muscle or a lot of tension in your muscle. And that's going to be different for everybody. And as I always say, basically when it comes to what modality you're using, what tools are you using? What exercises are you using? What's best is whatever's gonna probably help you achieve better personal alignment. Because in order for something to be effective, all you need to do is have something that is capable of influencing the fundamental process that is responsible for your results. And that's not hard. I want to get stronger. Okay, anything that puts a lot of tension through your muscle. Well, would that be a shake weight? Well, there's not really a whole lot of resistance there. There's not a whole lot of progression. You're not utilizing a lot of muscles along a chain. Would that be effective? No, not really. But as long as you're covering a few very basic fundamental uh, bases, like, okay, I'm using all the muscles in my basic tension chains, and I can put a lot of resistance against it to generate a lot of tension, that's basically the only requirement you have. And as I always say, you know, what is what makes a good type of modality for generating strength and muscle? Well, you need to have a good amount of progressive resistance, and that's it. That is the only requirement. All of the other things that are going to make it best depend on you, my friend. Does it fit your preferences? Does it fit your equipment availability? You know, I could talk to you for years how 
awesome barbell lifting is. But if you're like, I hate using a barbell, it hurts my joints, and there's no barbell access in the gym that I go to, well, then it's a bad modality for you. Not because it's ineffective, because can you get a lot of resistance through your tension chains with a barbell? Yes. Okay, good. It's as good as it's going to be. You can't get any better than that. But does it help you achieve better personal alignment? Do you enjoy it? Does it work with your proficiency? Right? If you spent the first ten, you know, 10 years of your athletic career learning gymnastics and you got really good at gymnastics, and then I'm like, okay, you're going to take on Olympic lifting, that's going to be really weird and different for you. But if you're like, dude, I can do muscle ups and pull ups and dips and stuff like crazy, that's probably going to be better for you. Not because it's a better modality by the science of it, just because of who you are, what you are capable of doing. So the best modality for you to get the best results depends largely on you and what you can do personally for that personal alignment versus what the actual modality really is. So know thyself, in other words. Zaid saying, hey, Matt, what would be your advice to a person, excuse me, who is consuming around 50 grams of protein a day and making slow gains in strength and muscle? Well, I would say there's a hell of a lot more to building strength and muscle than how much protein you're eating. And protein is important, but it's like that much of the entire equation. There's lots of variables, lots and lots of variables. And usually when I'm assessing someone and they're like, I'm not making any sort of progress, I'm not making the type of results that I want, usually I'll go after what are the things you're ignoring? So if someone's like, dude, I've got my workout dialed in, I'm really focusing on getting my programming exactly right and stuff, usually I'll be like, okay, programming, put it on the back shelf, I don't care. What's your sleep like? You know, what's your diet like? How's your stress relief? How's that coming along? And a lot of times I'll just kind of look at the ground and kind of shuffle their feet and be like, yeah, I know I party an awful lot and maybe I get about five hours of sleep a night. I'm like, okay, forget about the protein. That's where you need to go. A lot of times our ability to make progress is in the things that we're sweeping under the rug. It's not the stuff we're focusing on much of the time. So with that, I mean, 50 grams certainly does seem very low. Uh, in general, but it's not like unheard of low. It's not like you're starving or anything. I would say, make sure you're getting a good protein source at each meal. Get more if you can, you know, because you, you just want to check off that box just to make sure. And uh, if, and you say you're making slow gains in strength and muscle, dude, you're making gains. Most people don't make any ever. Okay. Uh, so social media has got this idea that we should be progressing really fast. And who says it's slow? Coach Summers of um, oh, Building a Gymnastics Body, he, he once went in one of his books, he said, building muscle is such a slow process that there's no point in measuring it any more than once per year. Because we think it should be happening faster than this. You could be making excellent gains for all you know. You could be making outstanding progress. But if your expectation is that it should be faster, it feels slow. So you may not be doing anything bad at all. It is a very slow process, my friend. Uh, but I would say make sure you're getting plenty of food. Make sure you're not dealing with chronic hunger. Look at your programming. Make sure you're covering everything. Make sure you're making progress and progressions and stuff like that and getting plenty of sleep. And that's where I would look at those sorts of things. Excuse me, I've got a chest cold that I've been dealing with over the past week or so. Speaking of lifestyle habits, I had a really rough weekend last weekend. One of those nights, I only got two hours of sleep and not for good reasons, unfortunately. So I, I, you know, same thing. I get run down, I got sick, and now I'm dealing with that. So uh, pardon for the interruptions of a bit of coughs and lots of tea here, but we continue on. Cristobal is following up saying, Matt, for back development, which is most important, uh, horizontal or vertical pull, probably doesn't matter uh, because as I addressed in my video uh, two weeks ago on rowing. I did a move of the day. I, every week, I do a move of the week on the YouTube channel where I kind of dive into the details of a particular calisthenics technique. And fundamentally, horizontal and vertical pull does the same thing. You have elbow flexion and shoulder extension. And the more proficient you are in using your pull chain, the less it should matter what exercise you do. And I know people have called me out on that I mean, it's like, ah, oh, you know, pull-ups are so radically different when, uh, than rows and stuff. If it feels really different, you're doing something wrong because fundamentally you're not using your body really that differently. 
And the better you get at using your muscles, the less the exercise selection should actually matter as long as it's basic fundamental movements. So you've got compound movement pattern. You should, over time, ideally, be like, yeah, rows or vertical pulling exercises, yeah, mix and match, switch and swap, doesn't really matter one way or the other. Just kind of changing up the flavor and the variety. So take it as a learning experience. If you do rows, for example, and you're like, man, these are blasting my uh, lats, and then you do vertical pulling, and you're like, it's all in the biceps. Okay, what are you doing different? Why isn't your back engaging enough on that vertical pulse? Usually it's shoulder stability or something. And of course, there's always going to be some difference, yes, but that difference should get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller over time. So you can use either back and forth. <laughs> Sam is saying, love the Morpheus glasses. Yep, these are my readers, the nose pinchers. I picked these up at the eye doctor about a month ago. These are the best, though, because uh, they're so much easier to carry with me. I can just slip them into a pocket real easy. They got a little case. And more importantly, I, one of the things I like to do is I'll read at night. So I'll be lying on my side of my head, and they're very comfortable. I don't have glasses like pushing into the side of my head when I'm doing this. So it's, these things are very, very comfortable. I love wearing these things. Not that I need them that much. I mean, oof, middle age is catching up with me, folks. <laughs> Last question before we continue along our conversation of what would happen if you did one set per day. Matt, hey, Matt, what do you think is to be successful in sports? How much is talent? How much is training? Hard to say. I mean, in my world of endurance racing, everybody should, in my opinion, get some degree of competition in a sport at some point in their life to get a real hands-on experience with how much sport and, and capabilities of the human body is really not a level playing field. Because there are some people out there who literally will roll out of bed in the morning, train for six weeks, and be better than 90% of the people on the planet at that given discipline, even though they've sacrificed blood, sweat, and tears at it. They're just simply people who are going to be really, really good at what they do, that thing. They have a gift for it. They have a talent for it. And I know they say like, oh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard and stuff. It's like, yeah, that's not been my experience at all. I've gone against bikers and bike racers and stuff, and they'll literally be like, I haven't touched a bike in three years. And they'll literally destroy me on the trails. It's like, how are you so flipping good? And they're like, yeah, you know, I just smoke a pack a day and everything. And it's like, dear Lord. So that's always, it's not level. It's not fair. Fitness is not fair. There are people out there who will literally just look at a pull-up bar and pack on muscle. And there are people out there who can do everything right and they'll barely make any gains no matter what. So talent and genetics and stuff do play a very big role. But usually it's more of a role for the outliers. Usually you're going to hear about either the frustrations of not being able to do anything despite how hard they work or how awesome they are even though they get drunk every night and they have these terrible lifestyle habits. Usually you hear about that sort of thing from the outliers, which chances are very good. You're not one of them. I'm sure as hell not. I've been like average and mediocre at everything in life, uh, even on my best days. So generally for most of us, we're average. I know people don't like to hear that, but you know, that's the, the case. You know, if you've got 10% on one end of the bell curve and 10% on the other, 80% of people are going to be average. And so in that case, it's going to be much more down to hard work and programming and knowledge and learning and stuff like that. So for most people, it's more about the work. But for some people, that talent certainly is a very big variable. So set a day. First and foremost, we have to ask ourselves, would it even matter at all? Because fundamentally, remember that we get the results we have by how much we're influencing a fundamental process. And with physical training, that process is we create a physical stimulus, and then we have adaptation to that stimulus. Okay? So as long as you've got that stimulus, and you're allowing the adaptation to happen, which is largely on autopilot, you don't need to do anything special for that, you're going to get the result that you're asking from that stimulus. So for the most part, it really doesn't matter how you work out or what you're doing. If that fundamental stimulus is there and you're able to allow that adaptation, you're not having huge lifestyle disruptions or anything that, that prevent that sort of thing, 
then you're going to get the, roughly the same result regardless of what your workout program looks like. Regardless of your programming, regardless of the exercise you do, if I'm working my bicep against resistance like this and creating that stimulus of I need my bicep to hold more tension or burning out, I'm going to build bigger, stronger biceps regardless of any other variable. That's the only sole thing that needs to be there. So doing a set a day of handstand push-ups may very well not do anything different than doing handstand push-up workout two or three times a week because you're still fundamentally doing the exact same thing. You're creating that stimulus and allowing adaptation to happen. No different. So if nothing is different on the fundamental level, you can't expect a different result, even though superficially you're creating different levels of, uh, you know, you're like, well, if, what if I do it every day versus twice a week and stuff? That's more superficial details that may or may not really matter all that much. And that's not a bad thing. Because if something doesn't do the same thing on the fundamental level, then it won't work. It's not going to work better. It's just not going to work, period. That's why a lot of times new workouts come out, new diets come out, new strategies come out. And they're, the first round of research and studies on these new methods is usually to establish if there's any validity to that method. And a lot of times, if there's validity to it, then they'll be like, yeah, these people went on this diet and they lost weight. These people did this program and they got bigger and stronger. And usually the zealots of that method will then use that research and that evidence-based uh, uh, studies to support like, see, our method is valid. Our method works. Our method is awesome. And they'll use it in their marketing and their evangelizing. And it's like, this is why our method kicks butt. But they don't usually focus much on the second round of the research, which is usually when people say, okay, it works. Now let's compare it to everything else that works and keep it variables as much in check as possible to see if it's just basically doing the same thing on the fundamental level, which inevitably almost always it does. You know, why does this diet work? You're just eating less. Why does this workout work? You're just working your muscles harder progressively over time. Why does this work? You're getting your heart rate up. Inevitably, the research always comes down to a fundamental level once again. That's why when people ask me, like, is there any research or scientific validity behind a fundamental approach? My answer is always the same. Yeah, all of it. Every bit of research that's ever come across my desk always points to things work because they all do the same thing on the fundamental level. And the people who are the zealots for the method don't like that because we all like to think we've found some sort of secret hack or loophole with mother nature. It's like, no, it's about this hormone opposition. No, it's glycemic index. No, it's about blood pressure and sugar, getting the muscle to do. No, it's not. You're doing the same thing as everything else that's ever worked. And we don't like that. We have our methods of choice and we like to feel like it's unique and special and, and it has an advantage. And the fact of the matter is it doesn't unless it's an advantage for you personally. You know, I love calisthenics training, but does it have any real reason why it would work better for building muscle and strength than anything else? No, but that's not a bad thing because the only reason why it can work is because it has to do the same thing as lifting dumbbells or barbells or cables and bands and stuff. Because if it doesn't do the same thing as everything else, it simply won't work. So when it comes to set a day, there's a very good chance it's not going to do anything different because fundamentally we're still doing the same thing as if we did two or three sets a couple times a week. It's the same process. We're creating a stimulus and we're adapting to it. All we're doing is we're taking that process and we're just kind of speeding it up a little bit. Instead of a big stimulus two or three times a week, it's a smaller stimulus every single day. Excuse me, I got a little bit of a coughing fit here. <clears throat> Apologies. So the good news is that it works or it can work. The bad news is, no, it's not going to do anything unique or different or be some sort of a special hack. So take it or leave it for whatever you want. But in a little bit, I'll explore why it might make a difference for someone personally. Zaid is saying, Matt, is breaking out of the inertia that you spoke of something that can be applied to diet as well? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Happens all the time with diet where people will start to change a habit 
about their diet. And it may be a little bit difficult at first, but then remember that our bodies adapt to our dietary habits, just like they adapt to exercise. If you've been eating nothing but junk food and fast food and stuff for years, and then you switch to more of a whole food, almost like a plant-based diet, it's going to be hard at first, but the floral gut bacteria changes. Your literal uh, enjoyment and your taste and your sensations of the food changes. People, sometimes they'll give up a food and then they'll try it again. And it's like, boy, this doesn't taste as good as I remember. Yeah, it's because literally our body is always adapting to regain homeostasis with whatever dietary habits you have. If you don't normally eat donuts for breakfast and you start eating donuts for breakfast, you're going to eventually start to crave donuts for breakfast because your body doesn't care what you eat. It only cares what are you giving me and how am I best going to use it? So if you eat nothing but donuts for breakfast for several weeks, you've now set up your system to live off donuts. So your momentum is now about eating donuts. But if you've been eating donuts and then you go with like steak and eggs, you're going to build inertia for steak and eggs. Your body, again, like with exercise, it doesn't care what you do. It just says, what are you giving me? And then I'm going to set myself up to best handle whatever you're giving me. And then the momentum is feeding more on, I'm going to keep going with whatever that is you know, warts and all, whether it's good or it's bad. So yes, absolutely applies to diet for sure, which is why we want to be mindful of what we're eating and purposefully eating in a good direction. <clears throat> Russell and is saying, Matt, thanks for the content. You're welcome, my friend. I know that you're a big fan of TRX straps, not technically, but I know what you're talking about. Uh, do you know someone who achieved a great physique using only them? No, uh, and largely because I don't know of anyone who achieved great physiques using only anything. You know, best physiques, best approaches and stuff are always going to come from a myriad of modalities and inputs. And even if someone's like, oh, I only use TRX, I'm only a TRX uh, user and straps and stuff, you look into their program like, yeah, but you still like to walk to work in the morning. Yeah, but you're, you're still practicing jujitsu. You know, all that stuff still follows into it. Remember, everything that we're utilizing is only an influence towards things. And no matter, even now, like if I use my, my straps exclusively, and I was like, never anything else, just the straps, you still wouldn't be able to say, well, he has that physique because he uses those straps. I've got 20 years of everything else that I've been doing associated with that physique. I'm still a mountain biker. I'm still a skier. I'm still a martial artist. I'm still lifting plates and putting them away for clients at the gym and stuff. We always have many influential variables in building up our physique. Now you may, I think you're asking like, it, does it offer some legitimacy to it? Don't think about the modality. Like, oh, look at this gymnast. You know, the gymnasts have amazing physiques. That's validity for body weight training. No, it's not. You know, you're not gymnastics training. Don't worry about what the modality is. Modalities aren't, the effectiveness is not in the modality. There's nothing about TRX straps that's special. There's nothing about lifting a weight that's special. It's whether or not you're achieving those fundamental objectives in your training and whether or not that particular modality can help you do that. And again, that depends largely on you, not the modality itself. <clears throat> but I've always personally thought, you know, I'd love to have a home environment where Basically, I just have a, a pair of my straps hanging from the ceiling, and that's my gym. You know, right now, I've got my, my dash here as a, you know, a place to hang stuff from, and I go down to the gym in the, the Zia basement here because they've got some really good pull-up bars down there and stuff like that. But I've always wanted to just have straps and a weight vest and maybe some isometric straps and stuff to, to use just for the ease of it. Simplicity. I like it. Joseph Bello, home at... I do push, pull, squat. I'm thinking of doing push exercise in one workout, squats and pull with hamstring and glutes in a different workout, A and B workout, and have short workouts. Yeah, very good. Just get the work in, my friends. Just get the work in. That's the most important thing. Fundamental movement patterns, basic progressions, and just get the workout in. And when I'm coaching clients, when I'm building out their programs, 90% of what goes into the programming is just me looking at them saying, what can you stick to? What kind of workout can I build you that you're going to be able to stick to? If we do an AB split, do you think you're going to be able to stick to that? Uh, probably not. I only work out a couple times a week. Okay, full body it is then. That 
personal alignment is m- pretty much what I'm basing all of my programming off of. Because as long as we're getting the basic movement patterns and we have progression, I don't need to worry about what the actual exercises are and stuff. I need to worry more about the personal alignment of what can the person just do and do consistently. Cristobal is saying, hey, man, I had a farmer walks to my train and my upper back got bigger. Sure. I would say that the isometric part of the exercise helped, but I'm not quite sure. Oh, no, you're 100% right. 100% correct is that carries. So again, fundamentally, this is time and tension in the muscle, time and tension in the muscle. And it's an isometric that can be a lot of time for a decent amount of tension. And I, I farmer walks can be very effective for that. I saw a buddy one time, he was talking about a fitness, like it wasn't really a contest. It was more like a seminar that he was involved in or something. And they, it, part of the thing, they gave him a couple 35 pound kettlebells and they're like, farmer walks. And he's like, Farmer walks, 35 pound kettlebells. That's not enough. This is easy. And they're like, well, you're gonna you're gonna farmer walk to the cone. And he's like, all right. Um, where's the cone? And they're like, a mile down the road, get going. And he's like, you gotta begin. He's like, by the time I got back, I, like my whole back was screaming at me. My grip could barely hold on to the kettlebells. You know, it's like farmer walks are like that. They can, whenever you're training, man, for distance, that can be a whole nother ball game. Good job, man. Dr. Barr is saying, hey, Matt, due to my exams, I had to stop working out completely for three months, but I'm back, but I've lost all my strength. How should I get back to working out? You just do what you can with what you got, my friend. You know, you, so let's say you were uh, doing a five by five with uh, weighted pull-ups and 45 pounds. And you're like, I can't even do pull-ups now, but I can do bodyweight rows. You do bodyweight rows. You do what you can with what you have. That is the single rule when it comes to workouts and programming. I'm never gonna base a workout on your age. I'm never gonna base a workout on, are you a doctor? I'm never gonna base a workout off of, you know, how many years you've been training. I don't care about any of that stuff. Whenever I meet a client, there's only one thing I care about, which is what can you do? What can you do right now? Can you do this squat? Yeah, is that easy? Very easy. Okay, let's give you something a little harder. How about this squat? Okay, that's harder, but I'm struggling with the balance. Okay, so let's give you something with a little more resistance, but less of a balance component. How about that? Good, now I'm really working hard and I don't have to struggle too much, but it's still challenging my stability. Okay, great, that's the exercise you do. You always base things off of what can you do now? But because you have the foundation, be mindful that you're probably gonna slingshot back towards higher levels of strength relatively quickly. So you could start doing rows this week, you'd be like, man, I got 10 body weight rows. Okay, great. And the next week, you're like, now I got 20. And the following week, you're like, now I can do five pull-ups because your body's going to snap back very quick. So you just base it off of whatever you can do. You don't try to force it. You don't try to make anything happen. You just, what can you do now? Just treat it as if that's what you always have done and then progress as you can. Ruslan is asking, what about one rep a day? Yeah, people have done that too. People have certainly approached that method as well because we want to be mindful of volume as well. Generally, in as a whole, more work produces faster results. But as I was talking about earlier, where we have our fundamental process of training, we create a stimulus and we have adaptation. We have a stimulus and adaptation. So it's just a case of how long that cycle lasts. Is it every three days? Is it every five days? Is it every 24 hours? And so on. But we also have to be mindful of the other process, which is stress and recovery. So we have stress and exhaustion upon the body, and then we have recovery from that stress. That is different. It is separate from stimulus and adaptation. And we need to be mindful of that as well, because training is stressful. Training is hard. We're going to impart some degree of stress upon mind, body, and lifestyle. So we're going to need to recover from that. The more stress you have, the more recovery you're going to need. Now, how much stress? That depends, again, entirely on you. You hear a lot of rhetoric in our fitness culture of, oh, if you work out, you have X amount of stress, you need X amount of recovery. That's just an estimated guesswork right there. Some people, they can do 100 pushups a day. And that's more than enough recovery to recover from that. Other people could do 10 push-ups 
and they're going to need a good 48 hours because it depends on many different variables. Again, I'm not going to base your programming off of arbitrary numbers or assumptions on things like gender or age and things like that. I'm going to base it off of what you give me. If you do a hard leg workout on Monday and then on Wednesday, you're like, man, my legs are still killing me. Okay. You're going to get more recovery. But if you're ready to rock and roll the next day, well then kill it, go for it. Absolutely. So with one set a day, the thinking is that we're creating a very frequent stimulus, but because it's only one set, the stress level is relatively low. It's not going to be that high. So in theory, we should be able to recover within that 24 hours. We should be, now some people may not be able to, if you started a set a day and then after the end of the week, you're like, man, I'm really starting to drag here. Things are tired and stiff and sore. Okay, then give yourself a little bit more rest or whatever. But it's the same process. It's just going a little bit faster. It's simplifying. It's making it a little bit slower and, and not quite as big because if you worked out on Monday and you just destroyed your arms and your shoulders with handstand pushups, you're like, okay, I better recover all the way through to Friday because you had more stress. But if you did one set and you're like, well, that wasn't very hard on the body. Okay, do it again the next day. It's the same process. It's the same thing. Remember, everything in fitness is about speed. When we do something to our diet and exercise, we're not doing anything unique or special. All we're doing is we're changing the speed at which things are happening. That's it. That's all any diet and exercise habits do. So with the set a day approach, we're just simply changing the speed at which we're accumulating stress and then the speed at which we can recover. That's all we're doing. <coughs> So does that mean anything? Not particularly, but it does mean that it can potentially work. Cole's asking, Matt, thanks for doing this video. So with what you mentioned in mind, if I want consistent stimulus and recovery, so mental fatigue doesn't go up and down, is one set full body a day the way to go? Could be, could be more. You know, keep in mind that the variables that influence that process are always going to be changing. There's never one static approach that's always going to be best for you. That's why my adaptive approaches are, in my opinion, kind of the way to go. Some days you do more. Some days you do less. Sometimes you're going to eat a lot more. Some days you're going to eat less. Sometimes you're better off eating pizza and drinking beer. Sometimes you're better off with salmon and kale salad. Having an adaptive approach is generally going to be a better way to go about it because no single static approach is going to be best. It's like telling you to drive one speed in your car all the time. I mean, right now it is snowing gangbusters here in Denver. So everybody's driving real slow on the streets. Can you imagine what would happen if you drove, if you went out on the roads and you're like, speed limit says 75 miles an hour. Here we go. And everyone's like, dude, you're insane. You're crazy. There's six inches of snow on the road. It's like, nope. Says 65 miles an hour, I'm supposed to drive 65 miles an hour. That's the speed I'm going to drive at. That's called being irresponsible. And that's largely what we often do when we have our diet and exercise habits. It's like, what's the way you're supposed to do things according to science, according to a dogma, according to a particular approach? And instead, we should, again, look at our circumstances. Oh, I'm coming back to working out after a long layoff. Great. What can you do? Oh, I'm just starting off and my shoulders kind of hurt. Okay, what can you do? You always base things off of more of what can you do than anything else. That personal alignment is essential. That's the thing you want to base things off of. You just need a few basic fundamental principles in place to make sure you're on track to get the objectives for the results you want. And that's not hard. That's not complicated. But most of the decisions you're making is much more based on what is my personal ability. What do I need for my ability to do the thing? And that's what is much more important. Excuse me, folks. My voice is getting a little raspy here. Chest colds are not fun. <coughs> my apologies. <clears throat> so he's following up saying, just men opposed to a push-pull leg split Equal volume would consistently low volume, high frequency, be less up and down mentally than push, recovery, pull, recovery, etc. I think it's probably going to be about the same in the wash in, in the end. Uh, you're probably going to get the same result either way. Uh, I don't think it's really going to matter because ultimately, again, 
at the end of, it's not acutely what you do every day. It's what are you doing for the week, the month, the year. And if the stimulus overall is roughly the same, which it probably would be, then no, it wouldn't really matter very much. Or at least it shouldn't, again. But the person alignment can matter a lot. Some people can be like, oh man, it's just, you know, you get independent, like, oh, I didn't do my my workout for, for the day. I just, the day got away from me. It's like, okay. Then if you keep finding that to be the case, then you could be like, yeah, but I love just having an hour, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I like to tell life time out. This hour is for my workout. That's when I do my workout. I just give it everything I've got and I leave it all in the gym. Okay. Then doing something once a, once a day is not going to be in your personal alignment. Christopher is asking, Matt, is the late onset muscle soreness a good indicator of an effective workout? Kind of overrated. It's, it's an, an indicator of an effective workout, but not for the reasons we think it is. Uh, it means that you're doing something different and new to the muscle. And it, it doesn't mean it's good or bad. It just means different. And so if you get some muscle soreness, like sometimes a client will tell me, oh my gosh, I really feel it in my lats today. I never felt it in my lats. I would say that's an extremely good thing because it means that their lats are engaging more, that their lats are really waking up. They're able to engage their lats a lot better. And as I explain in all of my books, you can only work a muscle to the degree you can engage it. And especially for a lot of the back muscles, lats in particular, engagement for a lot of people is frankly terrible. So when clients tell me, they're like, oh, wow, I felt that in the glutes like crazy. My glutes were sore after those squats. And I look at their program, I'm like, we've been squatting for the past six months and now you're feeling it? That's awesome. Because that means that you're getting that muscle to finally really engage and work in the, in the, in the uh, exercise to a higher degree. That's awesome. But if you're doing squats a lot and then one day you do lunges and you're like, wow, I felt that in my quads, it doesn't necessarily mean anything really significant happened. So I would say in general, if you're not getting sore, that's usually a sign that your muscles are getting more used to the exercise, which is a very good thing. You know, it's a momentary thing. If you're getting a little sore, that usually means, okay, we accomplished something new. We moved the needle somewhere, but it also means that me, that you probably haven't been doing that sort of thing up until this point. So it's not a good thing, not a bad thing. It just means something different happened, which can be a good indication of something. But uh, ultimately, I would say don't focus too much on it. Never make soreness the goal is what I'm saying. You know, don't, don't make that the objective. Don't make driving your muscles into the ground your objective. Because fatigue, exhaustion, because remember, an effective workout comes from the stimulus and adaptation, not the stress and recovery. Stress and recovery is just the cost of your workouts. And when you make that stress or the work, the objective, now you're going after false idols, if you will, false objectives, red flags. And that's when things go off the rails a lot. Not able to drink too well today, apparently. Dr. Barr is coming back on. Say, Matt, can I do isometrics daily for the purpose of increasing my muscle connection? Will it affect my recovery? Very good question. Again, it depends on uh, programming and stuff. One of the great things, of course, about isometrics is that it imparts much less stress on the neuromuscular system. So the recovery is a lot faster. But I mean, I guarantee you, as we were talking about with farmer carries earlier, like if you do a mile of farmer carries and then you're sore as hell the next day, you're going to need more recovery kind of stuff. So it depends on how long you're doing it, how hard you're working at it and stuff. I, I do a lot of isometric stuff for about 20 seconds or so. And yeah, the next day, like I may not be sore or anything, but my muscles are still tired, you know, so I'm not going to be able to get what I can optimally out of working out. Like I care, you know, it doesn't really matter. I may still do something, but uh, it, it will affect things. You know, there's no work without some sort of stress and fatigue on the system. So yes, it will affect your recovery, but will it affect it enough that it's going to hold you back? Eh, try it. See, probably not. Probably not. Sean is saying, hey, Matt, if stimulus is what matters, how come when it comes to leg training, it seems no one has been able to achieve leg development the same as training with a bar? I'll contraire, my friends. I've got far better leg development now 
with my body weight training than I did with the bar. So it certainly is, is possible. The thing with um, <clears throat> your modalities though, again, is it depends on programming. It depends on proficiency. Most people in my experience have very poor lower body proficiency. They don't have very good mobility. They don't good, uh, have good activation and they don't have good stability. And when you try to do exercises that require a lot of those, like a lot of progressive calisthenics do, uh, you're just not going to be able to train your muscles adequately enough because you're being limited by other factors. And so that's why my methods in grind style calisthenics are all about ensuring that's not going to hold you back. So a lot of it's about user error. It's not about the modality. You know, it, it, again, very rarely does the modality really matter. You know, we like to think, okay, this modality is best for this. And these people got in shape because of this modality. That's not true. It's all down to that fundamental stimulus and adaptation and what the best way for you to achieve that is. And if you're struggling to achieve a stimulus with a modality, that's your fault because you, you're not using the modality well enough or programming it well enough. And I, again, again that's, that was my case. Like I've got much better leg development now with calisthenics than I ever did with a bar. Does that mean calisthenics is better? No. Does it mean it's better than for me? No. It means I suck at barbell training. <laughs> it means I didn't know what I was doing. I had poor activation and stability. The problem's my end. Remember, it's user error nine times out of 10, not the modality. As long as you get fundamental uh, a, uh, tension along a fundamental chain and you have progressive resistance, the modality is as good as it's ever going to be. You can't ask more for mod modality as far as effectiveness than that. <clears throat> Cristobal, hey Matt, do you think people should focus more on progressive overload tension rather than focus on getting a pump and endless volume? I, I would say, yeah, that's a, a good assessment right there. Uh, because remember, stimulus, people, stimulus. At some point, a lot of volume, endless volume, is just creating the same stimulus. You're not getting anything new out of it. It's kind of like asking uh, or learning uh, math, right? What's five times five? I don't know. Let's, let me write this out. Five times five. Okay. And it is 25. Oh, five times five is 25. You just created a stimulus in your brain to learn that five times five is 25. Okay. Next question. What's five times five? Uh, 25. What's five times five? Tw 25. And you ask for the next hour and a half. What's five times five? 25. I know what that is. Okay. You're doing the same thing, but you're not creating a new state. You're not, there's no new information coming into the body. So you're not doing anything really. You're just creating a lot more fatigue potentially. So we always want to be aware of what that stimulus is we're creating with every single set. How is that stimulus getting better or new or different or even just sometimes reinforcement is good. You know, sometimes that reinforcement is good. I'm getting it more in my lats. Good, do another set. Another, another, another. Now I'm really getting it in the lats. I'm getting it more. I'm getting it more in the lats. Okay, now I can do it with with hardly ever thinking about it. Good, awesome. Then we that volume was worthwhile. But if you're just going through it like manual labor, like, okay, another set, here we go. And my mind is drifting and everything like that. No. The stimulus always comes from your brain, not the resistance, not the uh, method that you're using. So if you're bored and you're just going through the motions, there's no new stimulus. Why bother? Why bother with it? <clears throat> but the progressive overload, that's new. That's, that's going to create a stronger stimulus. Ray Alling, Allinger is saying, hey Matt, I've been doing a single set of exercise to failure with machines, Arthur Jones style. Yep. Is this something that can be applied to calisthenics? Sure. It's just another form of strength training. Is one set enough stimulus to initiate growth? Sure. Why not? Because your, your body doesn't know what sets are. It doesn't know what uh, the, the thing that you're doing is. It just simply knows time and tension. So if those things are increasing over time, yeah, of course, that's all it needs to be. Increase in time and or tension. That stimulus of how hard is the muscle working and how long is it working for? And as long as you got that, you've got everything. <laughs> you have everything that's necessary. The method, again, is not that important unless it's important to you and your personal alignment. First of all, say, do you ever count how much protein you eat per day? Nope. I don't count a damn thing. I don't count calories. I don't count protein. I don't count macros. I don't do 
any of that stuff. One, because it's a total pain in the ass. Uh, two, because it's estimated guesswork at best in most circumstances. Three, because a lot of times uh, counting numbers as far as diet lends itself to a lot of processed foods. I see this happen a lot. It's something that happens with people who get really obsessive about calorie counting and really obsessive about dialing everything in. They really start reading a lot of labels and labels are more on packaged foods. It's a lot easier to control your intake when you eat more processed foods. It's really hard to just pick out a steak or a head of lettuce or something at the grocery store and being like, well, what's in this? And even if it has a label, it says, okay, uh, this much protein per ounce. And then it says how many in the package varied, like you might as well just not even have a label at that point. So counting isn't a bad thing. It can give you a general estimation ballpark idea of what you're doing. But beyond that, I'm like, okay, get that estimation, get that ballpark, and then don't worry about it anymore. I don't count things that we get so much data obsessive uh, in our fitness culture. We've got all these trackers. Like I got the you know, Apple watch and stuff. I got everything tracking on this. I got sleep. I got steps. I've got my workouts and everything tracking on this. Do I care? No. Do I ever look at it? No. Do I ever use it? No. <laughs> yeah. it, it, for me, it's much more of, you know, am I eating regularly? I know when my diet is off the past week or so, especially last week, you know, I know my diet's off. I'm eating less. I'm not getting as much as I usually do. Do I need a tracker to know that? No. If your numbers are so fine-tuned that you need a tracker to know that a change has happened, it's not going to be a big enough change to probably make a difference. But if I'm eating quite a bit more food, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm definitely eating a lot more these days. How do you know? Because I'm eating a lot more these days. My grocery bill's going through the roof. You know, it's the sort of thing. It's like, oh boy, I, I went out and I got a big double bacon cheeseburger and a large fries. And then I went home and had dinner. <laughs> you know, I was like, that's a lot more than I usually eat. That's all you need to know is what kind of deltas and changes are you, may, are you creating in your dietary approach? <clears throat> is there any way to fix bow leg? Not that I know of. I'm not much of a, a podiatrist to really know. That's more of physical therapy. Uh, get some hands-on instruction from someone who is a professional in that sort of thing. It could be a lot of different things that going on. It could be a hip issue. It could be a structural thing in the knees, the ankles, uh, your feet. Uh, there's lots of things that could be addressing that. See if you can find a qualified professional where you live and get some hands-on expertise on what may be causing it and then address it directly because there could be lots of different reasons for that to be happening. So what do we expect from set a day from here on out? Well, right now it's been a week, but I mean, a week is too short a time to really notice anything, right? I do feel like my shoulders are kind of a little bit more formed and stuff, but that could be completely psychosomatic on my end uh, because it's funny how we can perceive our body changing when it really isn't. But uh, I am noticing that I'm more comfortable with the exercises. The other day I got down into a bridge and I was able to put more weight on my thumbs and have more of a equal pressure on my hands as opposed to having it go to the outside. So I certainly count that as a win. I also noticed that on my right leg, I was pushing a little too much into the bridge with my feet and my right foot was turned out slightly, which caused a little bit of stress on the inside of my knee. So I corrected that. So that's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, overall, I'm getting more comfortable with the exercise which is ultimately really what I'm doing this for. I just want to get more comfortable and used to the exercise. Because when I go into a handstand or when I do bridges, there's always this, oh God, oh, this is weird and it's awkward and it doesn't feel very good. And it takes me a couple sets to get into the groove and oh, 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 oh. I'm trying to get to a point where it doesn't feel those personal levels of friction in there that my body just does it without any hesitancy. It just takes to it. It gets used to it. I want it to be easy for my body. I want to become more proficient at these exercises. That's what I'm really doing it for. Will it make me stronger? Will it help me build muscle and stuff? Probably not. Will it help me become more proficient? I think so. And if I become more proficient at the exercises, then yes, it will help me build more muscle and strength. Because our ability to build muscle and strength is always based upon our level of proficiency with how well we can do the exercise in the first place. 
how well we can engage our muscles. That's what all of my books are about, is improving our proficiency in that. You improve your proficiency, your exercises get more effective, they get more enjoyable, they get a hell of a lot safer. Everything you want and none of the downsides come from that proficiency. <coughs> Pardon. And so if it does just that, then it's well worth it. And we'll see where it goes from here on out. But that's the ultimate goal for me with this single set a day approach is can I just get more comfortable with it? And so far it feels like that's happening, but I'll keep you guys posted as the experiment lingers on for the next month or so. Ask a last couple of questions before heading on out. Dr. Barr coming back on saying, Matt, why you don't stress protein intake, uh, counting protein as much as other fitness influencers? Just because it's largely, like I said, a pain in the ass and it's not necessary. Um, you want to make sure you're getting enough, right? And for that, I usually tell people, make sure you're getting some good protein at each meal. And if you think maybe I'm not quite getting enough, then get more of what you normally have. The most important thing in your diet and exercise habits is just to establish a baseline of consistency. What kind of foods, how much are you eating, when are you eating? Roughly a stable diet, a stable diet. And then if you're like, what if I get more? Well, then just get more and see what happens. And if it really should matter, if it really matters, it should be very obvious. Like I had a guy one time come to me and he's like, what if I drank, had a protein shake once a day? I'm like, I don't know, give it a try, see what happens. And like two weeks later, he's like, dude, I had these protein shakes now. Holy smokes, what a difference that's making in my entire life. I feel completely different now. Everything is so much better. Okay, great. Obviously, the guy could do more of a protein, right? But that's rarely ever the case. Usually, like I used to work with a guy who was always trying to fine tune his diet. And he was like, oh, what if I had strawberries instead of blueberries and all these sorts of things? What if I had two and a half eggs versus three eggs and all these dialed in things? And eventually one day I was like, you're always tweaking and making these little adjustments and stuff. Does this ever make any difference at all to you? you know, I've never heard you say anything matters at all. You know, so if it mattered, then it should matter. But for most people, I find that it's just a lot of work for not really any real benefits. So I just don't bother with it. You know, if you think you would be better off with more, then eat more. Don't worry about what the number is. Just get more. And if it matters, then it should be a pretty obvious thing. It's probably not going to be, so don't worry too much about it. Generally, if you're getting a good degree of protein, good, like you should just sit down at your veal and like, that's a good protein source. That's a good amount of protein right there. You should have that with each meal that you're eating. And if that's the case, you're probably going to be covered. You're probably going to be covered. And I'm always about you know, not doing unnecessary work because in all honesty, I really do believe that most of the habits and most of the rules and most of the things that people are asking folks to do when it comes to health and fitness are just completely unnecessary. And it's a lot of effort for not really any benefit. And there's nothing that's going to hold you back more in your life than putting in a lot of work for things that don't really matter that much. We want things to be easy. We want them to be as easy as possible. We want our habits to be as little effort as possible for the biggest possible outcome. That's the recipe for, for success in everything in life. And so the easier we can make it with the best possible outcome, we're on for uh, doing things a lot better. Sean is saying, hey, Matt, when or how do you choose to move from two limb to one limb movements for progressions? Is it necessary to go to single limb if you can make double uh, still progress. Yeah, I mean, you can always make progress with easy exercises. You, know, you can do countertop pushups and you're like, great, now I can do 200 of these sorts of things. But I, I usually have the general rule of thumb of, okay, if you can get consistent 15 repetitions and like two arm pushups, okay, we're going to start playing around with shifting pushups and stuff. I like to train heavy. So generally when we're in the, the mid upper uh, double digits, 15, 20 repetitions, then I'll say, okay, start moving on to the unilateral stuff. Doesn't mean we don't do the bilateral stuff because we can always improve things. We can all, always be improving our technique and stuff. But yeah, if we want to train heavy, then I'm going to start doing unilateral stuff once you can do probably around 12 to 15 reps. <clears throat> all right, folks. I have a yelling kitty cat asking for dinner here. I'm going to let you all go. And I've got some 
nightclub action I'm going to be hitting up tonight. But don't forget, uh, this project will be going on for the next several weeks, a set a day. And if you have any further questions, you can always direct them at the Red Delta Project Instagram, just simply Red Delta Project. And uh, if uh, you have any uh, interest, like I said, about the uh, weight loss, breaking through weight loss seminar, link is down below. Go ahead and check that out. Free seminar that I took part in. Really excited about that. It's going to be an exciting thing. So I will talk to you folks next week. Till then, be fit and live free.